All right, we may still have some other folks joining us, but we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone this afternoon. We're thrilled um, to be bringing you this content today um, that so many of you have expressed an interest in. If you know someone who signed up but isn't able to attend live today, as I said, we are recording and we'll be sending that out to everyone. Uh, my name is Allison Bronco Tishy. I am the manager of membership services for the Connecticut Community Nonprofit Alliance, um, otherwise known as the Alliance. And um, I am thrilled to welcome you on behalf of the Alliance. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with us, we are the nonprofit um, kind of trade association, if you will, for the state. We consider ourselves the voice of nonprofits in Connecticut, and we work to strengthen the nonprofit sector both through our advocacy and public policy work up at the legislature, as well as through capacity building programs for nonprofits. We have um, a variety of trainings, our annual conference, which will be on November 20th um, of this year at the Connecticut Convention Center in downtown Hartford. We also offer a variety of networking opportunities um, and discount programs on our trainings, postings on our nonprofit jobs board, and um, through a academic partners program that we have that offers tuition discounts with 11 colleges and universities in the area. So if you're interested in learning more about um, the Nonprofit Alliance and about what membership would entail, um, I'd be the person to reach out to. You can either um, drop a note to me in the Q&A uh, which I think we're going to try and use the Q&A today as opposed to the chat. Um, if you put something in the chat, we'll, we'll be monitoring that as well. Um, or you can also respond to the reminder email that I sent out um, both this morning and yesterday. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Christopher. Thank you, Alison. My name is Christopher Estela Perez. I am a first-generation college student a woman of color, and like many others, uh, I have almost $80,000 of student debt, a former bachelor's degree here in a Connecticut university, but I'm also the executive director of the Student Loan Fund. Today, we are going to be practicing language justice and have hired WEPA translations to translate from English to Spanish. If you need English to Spanish translation, please click over to our translation services. There should be a little bar at the bottom of your page that will say translation services, click here. Vamos a practicar justicia lingüística y hemos contratado a WEPA Translations para traducir esta importante información de inglés a español. Si necesita traducción de inglés a español, por favor seleccionar los servicios de traducción. Le va a salir una pantallita pequeña que dice Translation Services en gris. Por favor, clique ahí y, lo va, y va a poder oír a Vero traduciendo lo que estamos diciendo. Uh, but a little bit about the Student Loan Fund. Uh, we are a borrower-led organization made up of individuals directly. I'm sorry, Krista. Um, yeah. I haven't been assigned yet, and I want to make sure that none of this information oh. gets lost. Okay. Yes. Thank you for that, Vero. Thank you. Bear with us just one second. Um, Vero, it's saying that you haven't joined are you using a different email address maybe than the one i had or what email address did you log in with no i'm not i'm using the invite that i was sent but it did say that i was wanda when i logged in i don't know if that affects it i don't know who wanda is okay you can choose me from the list of participants and assign me that way if that's easier oh okay let me try that um, it should say add interpreter and thank you everyone as we sort of troubleshoot this. This is our first time using translation services uh, on the webinar format. So we are bound to have a couple of hiccups, but we wanted to make sure we were practicing that language justice for you all. And your first name begins with V? Mm -hmm. Yes. And what are you showing up as participant? I'm not seeing Vero. This is Vero, ella, she. You can also um, make me host for a moment and I can assign myself if that's quicker and then I can pass it back to you. I'm just, oh, I see, okay. Okay, just made you host.
All set. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Vero. And thanks everyone for um, writing that with us because we know we want to make sure we're practicing that language justice and we know that hiccups are about to happen. So we appreciate all your grace. Um, okay, so a little bit about the Student Loan Fund and what we do. The Student Loan Fund is a borrower-led organization. We are made up of individuals directly impacted by student loan debt, and we're committed to restructuring predatory lending systems that, and practices that are negatively impacting us, our families, and our communities. We are the only organization in Connecticut organizing and advocating on behalf of more than half a million Connecticut student residents who collectively owe more than $18.3 billion in student debt. Um, nationally and locally, we are organizing and advocating for full student debt cancellation and free public colleges and universities. Over the last couple of years, through our organizing and advocacy efforts, efforts we have secured that Connecticut hire a student loan ombudsperson in charge of supporting borrowers and investigating issues with lenders and servicers. We have secured a private student lender registry to make sure private lenders have to report their businesses in Connecticut. We've supported in the creation of local student loan reimbursement programs and led the CT PSLF waiver campaign um, in partnership with nonprofit leaders, unions, and the Connecticut Project to ensure that all Connecticut residents would take advantage of the limited PSLF waiver program. We recognize that student loan borrowers struggle to access free and expert, reliable student loan debt advice. And we are so thankful for the Nonprofit Alliance and our partners at the Student Borrowers Protection Center for helping us make this information accessible to all of you and throughout the state. If after the webinar, you still need a little bit of support, SLF runs a peer-to-peer -peer support program. We will put that link and information um, in your material so you have it. And you can reach out to us if you have more questions about student loan fund, the organizing work that we do, and or if you need further support in your individual case. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and I'm going to pass it to Amy, who is going to give us a bulk of information from the Student Borrowers Protection Center. Thanks, Allison and Amy. And Amy, I just wanted to note that um, Beto had asked that we just slow down a little bit in our speech, um, I think, just to allow her time to do her interpretation. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to the Connecticut Nonprofit Alliance and to the Student Loan Fund for having me today. Um, my name is Amy Salata, and I'm the Outreach and Advocacy Manager at the Student Borrower Protection Center. We are a national nonprofit policy organization focused solely on alleviating the burden of student debt in the country. And we do this through a mixture of advocacy, policy making, and litigation to rein in industry abuses, protect borrowers' rights and advance economic opportunity for the next generation of students. I'm really excited to be here um, today. Uh, thank you for joining. I hope this information is um, helpful for you. Um, we have a packed agenda this, this afternoon, um, but I think, uh, I think it'll be useful. Um, one thing that I wanna highlight um, kind of at the top of this presentation is I think you'll, you'll notice um, two very important things. <laughs> um, they are both lawsuits uh, that are currently wreaking a lot of havoc on the student loan system right now. And so it's a very frustrating time for folks to be thinking about their student loans, managing their student loans. And that is largely because a number of um, attorneys general across the United States have been suing the Biden administration over different things. Um, and so it's caused a lot of chaos. And so I'm just, you know, leveling with you here that like, you're here because you're probably frustrated and you probably you know want to know the answers to these questions that you have and um in some cases like there aren't very good answers because because of these lawsuits and so i wanted to mention that at the top um but like you know certainly uh there's a lot of information here that i think will you know help you to feel empowered to kind of manage your student loans and, and figure out your best options um so with that i would like to turn to our agenda we're gonna start with some debt relief updates, review income-driven repayment, spend a good chunk of time on public service loan forgiveness, um, go over some important takeaways and get to your questions. Um, I will note that like, if your question is very specific and particular to your personal situation, um, I might not be able to answer that. We don't give legal advice, but we find that most questions can be answered with general program information. And so we'll get to as many questions as we can at the end. Um, all right, and with that, let's let's get started. So um, debt relief updates. You know, you might've remembered that 
debt relief was a thing in the news that the Biden administration, this was a campaign promise that the Biden administration made. Um, and so what is going on with that? Um, a lot of things have happened over the past couple of years. You might remember that President Biden announced debt relief in 2022 in August. Um, and that you know uh, got held up in court and went to the Supreme Court. Um, and the Supreme Court, you know, struck it down, um, said that it was unconstitutional, you know, illegal. Um, and so that same day, President Biden announced that he would push for debt relief for folks using a different authority. So using the Higher Education Act. That meant and required um, a process called negotiated rulemaking. It's when a bunch of folks kind of come around, um, sit down at the table, uh, negotiate over what the parameters of a program on debt relief, you know, more broadly might look like. And so those folks, you know, that included advocates, folks from universities, um, student loan servicers uh, came together. Those folks came together um, last, late last year and early this year under this negotiated rulemaking. Um, and the first round of rules came out for public comment. They split, they split the, the rules into two sections. And so the first round of rules came out for public comment earlier this spring. Um, a final rule has not been issued yet on, on that piece. Um, and we haven't seen the draft rule for the second piece. Um, so the second piece was on hardship. You know, what does hardship look like and how can we catch folks that are kind of falling under this broad umbrella of hardship? And, you know, we know that hardship... Um, is having student debt in the first place, right? That is a hardship. It, it shows that you, um, you know, didn't have the means up front to, to pay for your education. And that's a majority of folks, right? That they can't pay for their education outright. Um, and so this is kind of what the process was to get debt relief um, in the works. Unfortunately, uh, in September, seven states uh, led by the Missouri Attorney General sued the Biden administration over debt relief, um, over this plan B debt relief. Um, the lawsuit is really frustrating and alarming because the rule is not in effect yet. Um, and so, you know, this wasn't a program that was already in implemented. We don't even know what the final rule looks like. And so they've already preemptively sued the Biden administration over this. And unfortunately, um, the case got moved to Missouri and um, this debt relief is now blocked from being implemented. Um, it was granted a preliminary injunction, which means that um, it will be blocked until the, the case can kind of move through the courts and be decided by a judge. Um, so this is you know, very frustrating. This debt relief piece would have really helped folks who have been trapped in this uh, debt for a long time, who um, you know, saw their interest kind of ballooning their entire balance over time. Um, and so this is very frustrating, but um, this is where we're at. So there are no action steps to be done on this front. Um, you know, this is really going to be up to the courts now. And um, we have a lawsuits page that I can share in the, the chat after um, the presentation, and we can share it out later. But um, it has been kind of keeping up to date with what's going on on these multiple lawsuits. Um, and, you know, it's a great place to go for, like, good information on where things are at right now. So um, there's plenty to do, um, even if debt relief, broad-based debt relief, you know, isn't an option right now. Um, and one of those things that you can do is consider income-driven repayment plans. Um, so let's take a look at what different plans do. Uh, so when you uh, graduate school or, um, you know, after you leave school, you have a six-month grace period. And then after that six-month grace period, you have to start paying your loans. At this time, you're automatically placed in something called the standard repayment plan. That's the top left corner here. This has you paying off the entire balance of your loan in 10 years. Um, there are some other types of repayment plans too, like the extended repayment plan, which has the term much longer. And so you're um, you know, able to pay it off over a longer amount of time. And there's also the graduated repayment plan, which um, you know, has your payments starting out very low, and then they get higher as time goes on and as your income you know, goes up. Um, we're going to be spending the majority of time right now talking about income-driven repayment plans. These plans are um, often the most affordable option for folks because um, they are pegged to your income and not to the entire balance of the loan. And so, you know, as your income goes up, your payments will go up. But if your income goes down, then your payments could go down. You could even qualify for a $0 monthly payment. Um, one other nice thing about these income-driven repayment plans is that after 
20 or 25 years in repayment, you can get the remainder of your balance um, canceled. And so, you know, that is really nice, especially if you have a very large balance, right? And, and you know, there's no way I could ever pay this off. Um, you know, offering this cancellation to folks who have been in repayment for a long time is really a lifesaver for a lot of people. Um, if you're some seeking something like public service loan forgiveness, which we'll get to in a moment, um, that timeline is shortened to 10 years. And so, um, you know, you could be making income driven repayments, uh, you know, payments um, over 10 years. And, you know, those payments would be maybe lower than they would be otherwise. And then your balance gets canceled after 10 years of working in the public service. Um, there are tech, there are four types of uh, income driven repayment plans. So income driven repayment plans are like the umbrella. And then there are four plans that kind of fall under that. They're listed here at the bottom. Um, there's ICR, IBR, pay and save. Um, save is a new uh, repayment plan um, that was announced in 2022 as well. Um, these are all different plans and they all calculate your income differently. You know, some of them um, take into consideration if you're married and file your taxes separately or together. Um, and so they're all different. You could use the loan simulator tool um, or the loan calculator at studentaid.gov to kind of get a sense of where um, or how much you might pay under each of these different plans um, to give you an idea. One thing I want to note is that, um, you know, I mentioned a lot of lawsuits at the top of the call. Another swath of lawsuits um, has kind of been moving through the courts this year. This was also spearheaded by the Missouri Attorney General. Um, and 18 states sued the Biden administration over this new SAVE plan that the, the Biden administration announced um, that, you know, really like cut folks' payments in half in some cases. Um, yeah. And so uh, right now, if you're looking to get into an income driven repayment plan, the only ones that you're able to access in most cases are IBR, the income based repayment plan, or SAVE. Um, you, if you're a parent plus borrower, so someone who took out loans for their children, but, are, but it's in their name. Um, you could also apply for the income contingent repayment plan. Um, but for the most part, most folks are only going to be able to access IBR and SAVE. Um, one important note on the SAVE plan right now, that because of these court cases, you know, the Department of Education hasn't been able to implement this plan. Um, and, you know, this has really caused a ton of disarray. Um, if you apply for the SAVE plan, you will be immediately placed on um, in uh, like an administration administrative forbearance, um, meaning that you won't have to make payments. Um, but that administrative forbearance right now uh, does not count for things like PSLF or towards that 20 or 25 year mark under the income driven repayment plans. This is something that advocates are working really hard on because, um, you know, we think it's really unfair that those forbearances don't count towards these cancellation programs. You know, this is no fault of the borrowers, right? Um, you know, that that they're stuck in this forbearance. Um, and so at least that time should count towards PSLF and, and IDR. Um, so, I uh, just wanted to give you that background on some of the, the cases right now and how they affect these different IDR plans. Um, the SAVE plan was really nice because it raised the um, income exemption and so it was protecting more money that you, you know, could keep in your pocket. It also uh, eliminated 100% of the interest on your student debt after you make a payment. And so that was a huge problem that we saw with these income driven repayment plans where folks are making payments every month but they kept seeing their balances increase and increase. And that was very stressful. Um, you know, that's a very stressful experience for folks. So that was one really nice thing about the SAVE plan as well. It also excluded your spousal income if you're filing your taxes separately from your, um, your spouse. Um, it cut folks payments in half for, for folks, especially, you know, if you only had undergraduate loans, um, you know, the, the, the discretionary income um, was 5% instead of 10%. It also offered a shorter timeline for cancellation. So I mentioned those 20 and 25 year marks. Um, this had an option to kind of cancel your debt after 10, or, or I'm sorry, between 10 and 19 years in repayment. Um, so, you know, I want to give you the background on this plan so that, like, you know what you're uh, kind of signing up for. Um, but again, like, if you did apply for it right now, it would be, you know, you would be placed immediately in a forbearance because of these court cases. Um, so, let's see. So, these are the loans that are eligible for the SAVE plan. Um, all direct loans are eligible. 
Um, if you were already in repay, that was a, another income driven repayment plan before the pandemic, you were automatically enrolled in SAVE. Um, and so if you are thinking like, right now I, I'm in the forbearance and I never knew why, um, it might be because you were on the repay plan before the pandemic, you were automatically enrolled in SAVE. And then um, now of course it's held up in court and, and all those folks are in a forbearance. Um, if you're interested in this, you can sign up at um, studentaid.gov slash IDR, or you can contact your servicer as well. This is kind of the estimated monthly payment over the uh, under the SAVE plan. Um, this has a lot of zeros on this screen, which is what we like to see. Um, and so based on your family size and your income, you can kind of estimate what your payment might, have, might be under the SAVE plan. Um, so just hitting home again, um, that under save, um, it's held up in court right now because of these, this lawsuit. Um, it's not, you know, it's not offering any cancellation between that 10 and 19 year mark under the save plan. Um, you can't get lower payments and there's, there's no, uh, waiver of interest right now. It's completely blocked. You know, you're putting that forbearance. Um, but if you already had your debt canceled through the save plan, your balance won't be reinstated. And if you're seeking something like public service loan forgiveness and you are thinking like, I want to get my debt canceled after 10 years through the PSLF program, um, you know, that is still, that is still possible that like, this doesn't impact that other than, you know, the fact that those forbearances don't count towards PSLF at this particular moment in time. Um, all right, so happy to answer more questions about that at the end, because I know that that's a lot of information and it can be very confusing. All right, um, so yeah, just kind of reiterating, um, this is what happened after the, the same lawsuits went into effect, um, but right now on the website, um, these IDR applications do exist. Um, they were temporarily taken down, but they now are in effect. Um, and so you can still con consolidate your loans and apply for, um, you know, the, the safe plan and the IBR plan. All right. I want to mention something very briefly called the IDR account adjustment. Um, one other thing that is very com a common experience in the student loan system is um, service or mismanagement. You know, we hear this all the time. There are like droves of complaints that exist around your servicer not um, giving you the correct information, you know, maybe auto debiting your payment when it wasn't supposed to. Um, and one of these things, uh, remember I said that after 20 or 25 years, your debt could be canceled through these income driven repayment plans. Um, you know, a couple of reports came out in the past few years that detailed how servicers were, you know, were not um, tracking this at all. They didn't know how close people were to these thresholds um, of getting your debt canceled. They were pushing people, like steering people into forbearances and deferments rather than offering them income driven repayment plans that might have kept their monthly payment very low or zero dollars. And it would have, you know, given them credit towards these 20 or 25 year marks. Um, and so if you're thinking like I was in a deferment and I was in a forbearance, but you probably could have, um, you know, benefited from income driven repayment. Um, and so to rectify this, the Department of Education announced something called the IDR account adjustment. Um, this is basically a one time audit of all accounts to see how close people are to those 20 and 25 year thresholds. And so when you're hearing in the news that the Biden administration ca canceled, um, you know, X amount of dollars for student loan borrowers, some of it was happening through this IDR account adjustment. Um, it was happening in segments. And so um, they've been counting kind of any time in repayment, regardless of what payment plan you were on, um, wh whether you made a complete payment, what type of loan you had, um, they were counting some forbearances and deferments. Um, and then folks, you know, were kind of getting to keep credit before they consolidated, which was huge. Um, we can get into that in a moment under the, the PSLF section. But, um, you know, really just want to reiterate that, like, this was meant to help folks and get them closer to these 20 and 25 year thresholds to get your debt canceled. Um, folks who didn't have direct loans, who had these um, kind of commercial fell or Perkins loans, had to consolidate before June 30th. Um, and so if you didn't do that, then, you know, you wouldn't be captured in the IDR account adjustment. Um, but, you know, folks who did, or if they already had direct loans, you might see kind of um, this information appear on your account at studentaid.gov. And so um, it's really meant to, to track 
uh, how close people are and, and get more debt canceled ultimately. Um, one really nice thing about this too is that any you know credit that you accrued towards this IDR account adjustment also counted towards PSLF. And so if you're seeking public service loan forgiveness, it was a great way to get some extra credit um, for time that you should have had anyway. But you know this was really meant to rectify um, the issues that folks were seeing. All right, let's get to public service loan forgiveness. Um, so PSLF or public service loan forgiveness is a program um, where if you work in the, the nonprofit sector or if you work for the public service, um, you're able to get your debt canceled after 10 years of being um, you know, a public service employee and making payments on your student loans during that time. Um, it's the promise you know, that if you, if you do your time, you can get the remainder of your debt canceled. This program was um, enacted by Congress in 2007. Um, and so let's uh, kind of take a look at like what the, the requirements are for this program. There are four requirements for the program. You have to have a direct loan. You have to... Um, be enrolled in the right type of repayment plan, which for most people is an income-driven repayment plan. You have to work for the public service and you have to make 120 payments um, or 10 years worth of payments while meeting all the other requirements. Um, so let's dig into this a little bit deeper. So the first requirement is that you have to have the right type of loan. Only direct loans are eligible for PSLF. Um, direct loans have been the main loan type since 2010. So if you took out a loan after 2010, you likely already have a direct loan. Um, but if you took out a loan prior to 2010, um, you might need to consolidate your loans to make them eligible for public service loan forgiveness. Um, this all happens at studentaid.gov. Um, you know, the first step could be to, to kind of go into studentaid.gov, sign in and see what type of loans you have. If it says direct next to your loan, um, then that means you have a direct loan and it is already eligible. If it says um, one of these older loans, like a Perkins loan or a federal family education loan, which is what FELP stands for, um, if it says kind of those words next to your loan type, then you know I have to consolidate my loans um, and to make them eligible for PSLF. Consolidation is really um, quite easy. It happens at studentaid.gov as well. It takes about 30 minutes online. Um, you're basically taking out a new loan and paying off the old loan, but both of these loans um, you know, or like the new loan, the new direct loan will be held by the government. Um, it's just, you know, an outdated program that, um, that, you know, it, those loans are no longer being issued. Um, and so this is, um, kind of what it looks like for your loan type, the first requirement. The second requirement is that you have to be on the right type of repayment plan. For most folks, the most affordable option is going to be these income driven repayment plans. You can also, be on the 10-year standard repayment plan. But remember that um, in the 10-year standard plan, uh, your loan is already getting paid off in 10 years. And so in most cases, you know, your income-driven repayment um, payment will be lower than the standard plan. Um, the last two bullet points here are very important. The extended repayment plan that I mentioned at the beginning and the graduate repayment plan that I mentioned, um, for the most part, don't qualify. And so um, your options are really income-driven repayment plans or uh, the 10-year repayment plan, the standard plan. The third requirement is the right type of empl employment. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the definition of public service is work for a government organization that includes federal, state, local, or tribal governments, um, any 501c3 nonprofit organization, and then certain other nonprofits also qualify. Something that kind of falls into that last bucket is usually um, emergency services. Maybe they're not falling under like a county government or maybe they're not you know, listed as a nonprofit, but they're seen as doing work for the public good. And so that is something that usually falls, falls under there. Um, you also have to work for uh, you know, the place where you work for full time. Um, and that is defined as 30 hours a week. You can also combine multiple part-time jobs so, um, you know, if you work 10 hours a week, one place and 20 hours a work week, one place, and they're both nonprofits or one of them is a government and one of them is a nonprofit, you can combine all that time. Um, you just need to document, you know, all that time from your different employers. The last requirement is that you need to make the right number of payments. Um, that's 120 payments over 10 years. Um, you can prepay but and make, you know, lump sum payments for up to 12 months. Um, but 
you know, you can't, uh, like essentially you have to do the 10 years. Like you can't kind of double up on payments, um, and to try to get through it faster. Um, you know, the time requirement is, is real. Um, okay, so let's see like what action items folks, folks might want to take um, if they're seeking public service loan forgiveness. All right, so there are, you know, three steps here um, to kind of consider. So first, you know, is your employer a qualifying employer? What type of loans you have and do you need to consolidate your loans? And then have you certified your employment? Um, so we'll just walk through these um, to give you a sense of the steps that you can take after this call or on this call right now, if you're logged into studentaid.gov. Um, to kind of, you know, take action. So the first step is to see if your um, your employer qualifies. So you want to go to studentaid.gov and visit the PSLF help tool. Um, and you can log any employment that you've had since 2007 to count for PSLF. Um, and so, you know, you'll want to check to make sure uh, that your employers kind of come up when you when you search for them in their in their database. Um, to do this, you'll need the employer identification number of your um, employer. You can find that on your W-2. You can find that um, by asking them. Sometimes you can Google them and find it, um, but you'll need that to run the search. Most organizations will kind of pop up right away, um, but if your organization doesn't pop up or your employer isn't listed, it could just mean that no one else from your organization has ever applied to PSLF in the past. So, you know, you don't have to, um, you know, especially like if you work for a nonprofit and you know that you're a 501c3 nonprofit, um, you know, don't stress. Like it could just be that your employer, um, you know, has never like encountered anyone who's been seeking PSLF in the past. Um, so there is a way, you know, you, you're still able to, to, to log that time um, and get PSLF. Next, you know, you want to check what type of loans you have. So you can log into studentaid.gov, go to your dashboard, and on your dashboard, it'll list the loan types that you have. Um, again, if it says direct next to it, you know you have a direct loan and you qualify, uh, that loan qualifies. If you don't have a direct loan, you can make them eligible by consolidating. Um, again, that's, you know, through the, 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 um, the federal government. Um, this is different than a refinancing. Um, refinancing happens when you um, go through a private company to pay off your loan and then owe that private company um, debt. A consolidation is like a refinancing, but this happens directly with the government. Um, and you know the difference is that, like, if you refinance your loans with a private company, they will no longer be eligible for the, these federal programs. And so um, the, the distinction is very important. But consolidation works very similarly to a refinance. Um, all right. So if you need to consolidate your loans, you can also do that at studentaid.gov. And then um, finally on using the PSLF help tool, again, at, at studentaid.gov, you can um, certify your employment. And so anytime that you're trying to get, you know, time to count for PSLF, um, you'll, you know, log this employment and your employer needs to sign um, a form that basically certifies that you worked there um, full-time or part-time over, you know, whatever period of time it is. Um, and so, you know, they've they've just changed this, which is really exciting. Now you're able to do this electronically. And so right from studentaid.gov, if you have their email addresses, you can send them um, the link and they can sign, you know, right there. Um, if that's not an option or if you don't have their email addresses, you can also download and, and print, um, you know, the, the form itself and have them sign, um, you know, with a wet signature. Um, for this piece, um, you know, when you're certifying your employment, you can do this at any time. We recommend that folks do it once a year and every time that you switch jobs. So, um, you know, we recommend this because you're just essentially raising your hand. You're telling the federal government, I'm interested in public service loan forgiveness and I want this time to be accounted for. The reason we, we recommend this is because the public service loan forgiveness was um, kind of riddled with issues um, from its inception. Um, you know, only 2% of people ever received public service loan forgiveness before 2021. Um, and that's because, you know, folks uh, didn't know the requirements, their servicers weren't telling them their requirements. And so, um, you know, if you had a Fell or a Perkins loan, one of those older loans, um, and you tried to apply for PSLF, your servicer would just tell you um, your loan doesn't qualify. They failed to mention that you could consolidate to make them qualify. Um, and so, you know, that was a huge issue for folks. 
Um, so all to say that if you submit these forms once a year and every time you switch jobs, you have a better chance of catching any mistakes that are made and dealing with them in real time. Um, and we know that that, um, you know, that that like saves everyone a lot of stress in the long run. Um, and so uh, this is, you know, how you would kind of go about certifying your employment. Um, but your, you know, your employer will need to sign the form. All right. Couple more slides on CSLF and then we can get to um, takeaways and your questions, but um, just alerting everyone that those months of the payment pause, if you were um, you know, not pay making payments during the pandemic, those months count towards PSLF. Um, and you know, the only requirement then would be that uh, you, 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 know, you still had to work for a, a nonprofit or a government um, in the public service. Um, another thing that changed this year um, is that if you consolidate, you will receive a weighted average of qualifying payments that you made on a direct loan. Um, prior to this, you know, July um, rule change, folks who consolidated uh, to kind of get on track for PSLF, they lost any credit that they had made. Um, you know, any payments that you made on a Fell or a Perkins loan before you consolidated were completely wiped clean. And so you were starting the clock again at zero, which was really frustrating. So now at least you can get a weighted average of, of payments that you made on a direct loan when you consolidate. One note on Parent Plus borrowers here. Um, Parent Plus borrowers have similar steps for the PSLF program. You know, they still need to certify their employment for any employment that they've had since October um, of 2007. But um, you could also consider consolidating to get on an income driven or payment plan. Um, the only way that you can get on an income driven repayment plan with a Parent PLUS loan is by consolidating. And the only option for Parent PLUS borrowers is the income contingent repayment plan. Um, the ICR plan is unfortunately the least generous of these plans. Um, so their payments might be quite high. Um, and the other option would be the standard plan. Um, and so, you know, I think it's really about weighing your options on what's more affordable for you um, between the income contingent repayment plan or the standard plan. Um, and so something to consider if you're a parent plus borrower. Okay, let's just review very quickly. So remember to check what type of loans you have at studentaid.gov. If you have anything other than a direct loan, consolidate them to make them eligible. Use the PSLF help tool to get your employment certified. Um, and then just weigh your options if you're a parent plus borrower to see what the, the most affordable option is for you. All right, let's get to some important takeaways and then your questions. So check what type of loans you have at studentaid.gov to check your um, you know, eligibility for different programs or different repayment plans. Consolidate your loans if you need to for the public service loan forgiveness program. Um, use the PSLF help tool to get your employment certified if you're seeking PSLF. Um, we have a website called cancelmystudentdebt.org um, and we try, that's where the lawsuit page lives. There's a how-to guide on PSLF um, and some other um, kind of information on different programs that you might be eligible for. Um, and so we try to kind of keep that up to date um, so that folks have a place to go if they need more help. The last two things here are very important. Um, please beware of scams. Make sure that you're getting your information from a trusted source like studentaid.gov, um, or, you know, our, our website, um, because, you know, there are a lot of folks looking to take advantage of the chaos right now, and there's a lot of chaos. And so um, just please uh, be careful. You know, in most cases, the, the Department of Education does not call you on the phone. They will communicate to you via email. Um, and so just making sure that you're, you know, not giving away any um, confidential information. Um, also, please file complaints. Um, you can do this at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, the Federal Student Aid Office um, has an ombudsman uh, within the Department of Education. You can also file complaints with your Connecticut ombudsman um, in Connecticut, which is really exciting. Um, these are so valuable. You know, I can't tell you the number of policymakers that turn to these complaints to look for what the issues are and then try to fix the issues. And so the more people that complain, um, the more things will change. And so please file complaints when you experience issues. Okay, I know that was a lot of information, so let's get to your questions. Um, thanks so much for your attention. So Amy, I'm just gonna read them to you so it's easier for you. Um, is that okay, does that work for you? Perfect. 
Awesome. So some of them I was able to answer while you were talking um, and some of them I left so we can answer collectively. So a question that we have here is what is the difference between subsidized and, unsubs and unsubsidized loans? Mm -hmm. um, the difference is basically the time period that um, your loan started accruing interest. And so for subsidized, um, I think it, you know, doesn't start until after you graduate. And then for unsubsidized, it started while you were in school. And so for the purposes of public service loan forgiveness or for income driven repayment, um, it doesn't really matter, like whether it's unsubsidized or subsidized. I think you're really looking for whether a loan is direct or whether it's um, a different type of loan that might need to be consolidated. So um, that is really the difference. Thanks, Amy. Uh, for Maddie, we have, do these plans only impact federal student loans? Are there any laws or support resources for those with large private student loan debt? This is a great question. I love this question. Um, so yes, all of these programs that I mentioned today on this call are, are federal programs that are happening for folks with federal student loans, unfortunately. Um, but we know that private student debt is a growing market, that a lot of folks have it, um, that it's very big, and um, that there are way fewer protections to the private market. Um, that is something that, you know, the state could look to do, right? Um, you could... Uh, other states have kind of run bills to better protect borrowers um, with private student debt, like making sure that if you had to sign a private student loan, that your co-signer gets released after a certain amount of time, you know, when to, you know, you've been able to prove that you've been making payments. Um, and so I think this is totally an area um, that like we'll see more movement on. And um, yeah, I like I think that would be great in Connecticut, for for example. But yeah, um, yeah. unfortunately, there are a few protections and, and they're not eligible for these cancellation programs that I mentioned on the call. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, let's see. What else? Um, oh, this is actually a good one that I think speaks to some of the shifts. So somebody has mentioned that they've worked in nonprofit and filed the proper paperwork years ago. Their loan was servicer was changed to ED Financial in June of 2024. And some of you may have noticed that some of your servicers have changed over the years, particularly in the last year, and they have no record of their um, of their paperwork. What should they do? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think that this is probably the convergence of multiple things. <laughs> so as Krista mentioned, a lot of folks had their loans transferred to different servicers over the past couple of years. Um, if you are, you know, a person with Ed Financial and you got transferred in 2024, um, that is likely because Mohila, the servicer that was, um, you know, kind of formerly tasked with running the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, um, kind of relinquished some of its portfolio and they got moved to Ed Financial. Um, and so I think I, I'm thinking of a couple of things that could have happened. One is that your, you know, Ed Financial might just not have all the records, um, which is very bad, right? And so in that case, I would file a complaint. I think either way, this ends with me saying file a complaint. Um, but the other thing that I can think of is that this summer there was also a PSLF processing pause. And so, um, you know, I um, I think like checking your progress might not be up on, I can't um, say this for sure, but I it might not be up on studentaid.gov or on your servicer's site at the moment. Um, so that might, you know, be, be part of the issue too. I think um, either way, I think you can file a complaint um, to make sure that you, uh, you get the information you need on PSLF and make sure that, you know, it's accounted for. Thanks, Amy. And we're happy if you need extra support in filing that complaint or don't know the channels that you can. It's usually through the CT alone. One of the ways you can do it to Amy's point is to the CT ombuds person um, as well as the federal. And if you need more information about that, please feel free to reach out to us at FLF. We'll be more than happy to point you in the right direction. Um, okay, so we have a question here about I made payments for all 10 years as of during COVID. Can you reiterate a little bit of what the COVID pause meant for folks? Yeah, for sure. So if you were receiving the payment pause during the pandemic, it means um, that all that time counted towards PSLF, um, even if you didn't make payments. And so um, you still need to meet all of the other requirements of the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, like namely that you were working for a nonprofit or a government during that time. Um, but that time all counts towards PSLF. 
Thanks, Amy. And we have a little bit of, we have a question here about the recording and the slides and the presentation. And folks wants to know if we will be sharing the recordings and the presentation, we will. We will get a copy of the, we know this is a lot of information and we've heard from folks that recording works for them because they can pause, go back to that information. So we're gonna make sure that you have access to the recording so that you can go back and refresh your memory because we do know that this is a lot of information. Um, so we will make sure that we get that out to you all for sure. Um, let's see. Um, so there's, this is probably like reiteration of the PSLF. It says, so there's, I'll give you two questions in one. Um, if we have switched jobs within the same category, does that still count within the 10 years? Um, and does it have to be continuous over the, over the 10 years? Okay, this is a great question. I'll answer the, for the last one first. Um, it doesn't have to be continuous. So um, your time doesn't have to be consecutive. You know, you could work for the public service for a few years, um, you know, log that time, make sure you certify your employment, but you could move to the private sector for a few years. You know, that time in the private sector will not count towards PSLF, but you can pick up where you left off um, in a few years if and when you move back to the, the public sector. Um, and so that's really nice for folks. Um, I forget the first question, actually. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, uh, what if you switch uh, jobs through the same category? Does that still, like, I'm assuming it says if you switch job from a PSLF eligible job to another PSLF eligible job, does this still count within the 10 years? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess like any time spent for a public service employer counts. And so it's just a matter of making sure that you're, you're cert like you're certifying your employment. Um, and so, you know, if you switch jobs, um, but they're both public service employers, then yeah, you would just fill out, you know, two different forms and have two different employers sign those forms. Awesome. Um, let's see. IDR and PSLF information needs to be updated yearly with their forbearance in place due to the losses for SAFE program. Should I still be updating your information and are the service providers taking those calls? I've been trying to get through for the last couple of months with no luck or response. Okay, this is a good question too. Yeah, so um, one thing I did not mention is that under income driven or payment plans, you do need to certify your, your employment, or I'm sorry, not your employment. You need to certify your income every year, um, you know, so that the government knows how much money to charge you each month, right? So like when your income goes up, your payment will go up. Um, but if you have a very like, yeah, you know, say you lose your job, um, you know, you can call them and, and let them know that. And then your payment should go down to, to $0 a month since you have no income. Um, and so that's how they work. You have to certify your income. Um, and because of the payment pause um, and because we were starting to kind of enter repayment, um, the Department of Education has extended this multiple times. But um, I believe that you don't need to recertify your income until November of 2024 now. And so, um, you know, you might want to wait, actually, because if your income went up during the like, you know, in the past few years, your payment will go up as your income goes up. And so um, you you don't have to do this until November of this year um, as it stands. Thanks, Amy. And there's some questions about one-on-one -on -one support. So SVPC does not do one-on-one -on -one support. SLF has a peer-to-peer -peer support program. Uh, we are not lawyers and we are not accountants, but what we do is we are able to support you and connect you to experts on the field and make you aware of what your options might be. Um, and so if you are interested in getting a little bit more support to the peer-to-peer -peer support program, um, I will drop the link in the chat so that you can book a time, uh, a one-on-one -on -one time with, um, with our folks. Um, again, we are not lawyers and accountants and thus cannot give you legal accounting advice, but we can give you general information and teach you how to use things like the PSLF help tool um, so that you are able to better navigate your studentaid.gov website. So we're happy to share that with you all um, so that you have it. Um, let's see, one more. We have time, yeah, we have time for one more. Yeah. Let's see, part to the current pause. Uh, okay, this is a good question about um, uh, SAFE. It says, prior to the current payment pause, I was credited for 93 qualifying payments under the IDR account adjustment, I believe. It appears that I have 27 payments remaining under PSLF. I was paying under the SAFE plan prior to the freeze. Do you know if the credits will remain as it, current st as it currently stands right now? Are they gonna take those credits back? No, no one should be losing credit um, due to these lawsuits or anything like that. Um, you know, this, the public service loan forgiveness program was a bipartisan program. Um, mm -hmm. And so like, 
you know, it's, it's relatively safe, um, you know, in terms of like its existence um, moving forward. And so you shouldn't be losing any credit because of these court cases, um, you know, that, that shouldn't be an issue. Thank you. Let's see. Oh, okay. Can a, this is a Parent PLUS question. Can a Parent PLUS loan be consolidated while the child is in school? Hmm. I actually don't know the answer to this question. Um, I can write it down and get back to you later. Um, and then I think this is a clarification on the SAFE plan. Um, let's see. I understand correctly that SAFE plan will most likely go away. If this is the case, I will need to reapply for another IDR option once the payment pause ends. Is that right? Okay, so the payment pause has already ended. Um, this payment pause that was happening during the pandemic uh, ended last August. This past year, loans have been on something called the on-ramp. Um, and so what it means is that, you know, if you haven't made payments in the past year, um, some of the negative consequences associated with non-payment of loans, like getting reported to credit bureaus, um, you know, you got to getting sent to collections. Those haven't been happening for the past year. That's what the on ramp was. Um, however, the on ramp ended on September 30th. And so, um, you know, in the next few months, I think we're going to see more folks, you know, being delinquent, um, being, you know, put placed in default because of, um, you know, this on ramp ending. And so um, that is the reality. I think um, after, like, you know, it is a possibility that the safe plan may not exist, um, you know, after this moves to the court. Um, so, you know, you will have to kind of figure out which uh, repayment plan to be on from then. And and who knows what that will look like, right? You know, if this, if the safe plan can't be enacted, um, they might automatically place everyone on the safe plan on a different plan. Um, but then, of course, you know, you can change uh, which plan that you uh, want to be in. Uh, so I think I answered the question, but I'm, can you confirm that, Krista? <laughs> um, I think so. And I think, yeah, I think you answered the question because it was about the save. Yeah, I think that, and if I, she didn't, please let us know in the chat, um, or in the, in the Q&A again. And I think we have answers for, we have time for one more question and then we are unfortunately out of time. Um, it says, can I pay, this is a good question, can I pay a total of 120 payments in a lump sum and then just wait out the 10 year requirements? No, unfortunately you're only able to make lump payments um, for 12 months. So that's like the, the maximum amount of time that you could make payments for. And so, yeah, it would be great if you could just kind of get it over with at once, but unfortunately that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, so it is 12.58. And so what I wanna do is, Folks are going to get um, a list of um, folks are going to get sort of like a, a follow up from Allison um, and it will include information. It will include the webinar recording. It will also include places where you can reach out to us directly at SLF. Um, and so I'm going to put it in the chat right now. If you have any one on one questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, let me see if I can paste it in here. Well, it looks like I can't paste it. I don't know what happened, but we'll make sure you get it. Um, so that way, if you have one more one-on-one -on -one questions or need further support, we're happy to, to connect you with folks. Um, awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. I know this is a lot of information. I know that things are moving and that maybe some of the answers are sort of confusing or it is in a, we are in a confusing landscape. We want you to know that you're not alone. Right. In terms of the complaint process, if we can just repeat really quickly, Amy, where folks can complain if there's an issue with their servicers. And also, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll happy to connect you as well. Yes, please file complaints if you have issues. You can file a complaint with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. They have a very easy online complaint form. The um, Federal Student Aid Office, it's um, the ombudsman at, at FSA within the Department of Education. And you can also um, file a complaint with the Connecticut Ombudsman at the state level. You can also submit complaints to all three of those places if you're experiencing issues. The more eyes on this, the better. Um, so yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and I hope you were able to get some of your answers. And again, we'll make sure you get all this information, including where to sign up for more support um, in the follow-up email. And we appreciate your time, your energy um, to be here. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great afternoon.